Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Cooper Union Alumni Association, the CUAA, as we present Found in Space, featuring Larry Hausman, EE94. Uh, my name is Mark Vasquez, ME88, uh, CUAA Events Committee Chair, and I will be serving as your host for tonight's installment in the CUAA Alumni Showcase event series. Before I introduce Larry, uh, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping tips with you all. Uh, everyone is asked to please remain on mute with your cameras off for the duration of tonight's event. Uh, this will prevent any disruptions while Larry is presenting. We will have some Q&A after uh, Larry is done with, with his presentation. Uh, he will be speaking for 20 to 30 minutes. At that point, we will go into Q&A. Uh, and at that time, I will ask you all, if you have any questions, to post your questions in chat. Uh, I will then read through those and pose as many questions as I can. Uh, to Larry in the remaining time that we have. Uh, for your viewing uh, preferences, uh, you may be best off choosing under your view settings, uh, choosing the side-by-side -side speaker option. Uh, that will, uh, and, uh, and also going to full screen, uh, that will ensure that you see Larry and his slides in full, and that you also uh, won't have the distraction of multiple camera views uh, and whatnot on your screen. We are also recording this session uh, and we will post it online in the near future. And we'll let you know when that happens in case you wanna watch it back or, or share it with your friends. Okay, with that said, uh, let's begin. Let's bring uh, Larry on camera. Welcome, Larry. Hey, Larry. Hello. So uh, let me briefly introduce Larry before he starts his talk. Uh, after graduating from the Cooper Union with a bachelor in electrical engineering, Larry Hausman earned a Master of Electrical, I'm sorry, Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from Polytechnic University, NYU, and is both a licensed professional engineer in multiple states and a registered US patent agent. His career in microwave electronic devices and systems includes time at small startup companies and managing multi-million dollar programs and departments at large defense contractors. Currently, uh, Larry manages and operates a technical consulting company, which he founded, providing services to electronics manufacturers and to government clients with specialized needs. He has won awards for his work and is also both an adjunct professor at the Cooper Union and a visiting professor at SUNY's Farmingdale State College. From global satellite communication systems to Earth observation satellites to the Mars Science Laboratory, Larry has been a key contributor to a variety of space technology projects throughout his career. Today, he will be sharing his experiences on some rather interesting NASA projects. So with that, I give you Larry Hausman. All right, hello everybody. Uh, as Mark said, I'm Larry Hausman. I'm gonna talk uh, about some uh, projects that I've worked on and hopefully uh, you'll enjoy them as much as I've enjoyed working on them. Uh, my technical specialty is in what's called microwave electronics. It's a subset of uh, high frequency electronics and uh, systems and components. Generally, this is uh, 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz. It could be varying a little bit. And these frequencies are used primarily for things like communications, radar, navigation, uh, other uses also. Um, you find them commonly in your wireless systems in your home and things like that. Uh, but they're used uh, throughout our modern lives. Uh, stuff that I've worked on, uh, stuff that's in space, uh, stuff that's uh, airborne, um, stuff that's on the sea, uh, terrestrial stuff, uh, fixed, mobile, uh, both systems, components, pieces of systems, uh, large subsystems and various components. And some of these systems actually have multiple parts of these components in them. Uh, tonight, what I'm gonna talk about is uh, three different projects which I thought were uh, particularly interesting and might uh, be interesting for the audience. They are related because they're all uh, through customers related to NASA. So I think everybody has a, a little bit of relation to it. Um, so we'll start with a, a terrestrial based system for global satellite communication. Then I'll talk about uh, an orbiting uh, satellite system for Earth observation. And then uh, the last thing we'll talk about an extraterrestrial landing system, uh, the part that I built for it. And I'd like to show it to you. Right, the first piece is something called the uh, Tracking and Data Relay Satellite System, or TDRSS, or TDRS, as it's known. Uh, what you see here is a artist's rendition of uh, one of the actual TDRS satellites in space orbiting around uh, the planet. Uh, what is TDRS? Uh, 
it's a space network of communication satellites, ground stations uh, used by NASA for space communications. It's operated by NASA. It's owned by the U.S. government, and they have uh, what they call customers throughout the, the science and government communities uh, throughout the United States. Um, they're high data rate uh, communication satellites. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, 800 megabit per second uh, from space. Uh, think about that, that's almost a gigabit per second uh, wireless, and it's coming from space. So these are actually uh, very, very high data rate, very specialized systems. Uh, what they are, and I'll show you some diagrams of uh, the coverage around the Earth, you only need about three satellites to cover the whole Earth. They're in what's called the geosynchronous orbit. And this system needs to be up all the time for these government's uh, customers. So in order to increase the reliability, they actually have multiple spare satellites already on orbit. So they could just switch over and turn on immediately. So take a look at this. This is what's called a constellation diagram of the satellites uh, around Earth. They're in, as I said, geosynchronous orbit. And geosynchronous orbit, the location, the altitude is above the Earth's equator. And that's how they match the speed of the planet's rotation so they appear stationary in the sky. That's what that means. So what happens is low Earth orbit uh, spacecraft, for example, the International Space Station or the Hubble Space Telescope or some uh, commercial or NASA spacecraft, uh, they'll operate in a lower altitude Typically, the International Space Station is only a few hundred miles up. Uh, geosynchronous orbit is uh, you know, about 36,000 kilometers uh, in altitude, so it's pretty high out there. So this is actually what you have, is these geosynchronous satellites are up at this very, very high altitude. And these lower altitude spacecraft are in between the satellites and the Earth. So what they actually do is the satellites that are uh, these low Earth orbit ones, they actually have the antenna pointed not at the Earth, but up at these uh, TDRS satellites. So as they move around the Earth, they can communicate with the TDRS satellite. The TDRS satellite operates as a relay station, takes that data and sends it back to gateways on Earth. And the gateways are connected by fiber optic cables on Earth back to control stations and the analysis areas for the customers. So what happens is the, uh, for example, the space station is moving very quickly uh, across the earth because it's in uh, low altitudes. In order to maintain its height, it has to move very, very fast. Those are Newton's forces. And it would transit a space on earth very, very quickly. So you'd uh, lose sight of it from a ground-based antenna very fast. But what happens because these uh, TDRS satellites are so far away, thousands of kilometers away, uh, you don't lose sight of it so fast. So it can track the uh, spacecraft, the low orbiting spacecraft pretty well, stay in communication for a long period of time. And as, for example, the space station moves to another part of the Earth, it just switches over to the next TDRS satellite and stays there for about a third of its period. So about the third of its period, you can always see a satellite. Let's take a look at the constellation. We have uh, the Tetra satellites. They're, um, as I said, there's multiple on-orbit hot spare satellites is what they're called. They're alive, they're on, they're functional, they're operating, they're just not carrying the data traffic. So think about that. The International Space Station is one of the customers for this system. So you have people up there. If something goes wrong, they need to immediately switch over somewhere else and maintain communications with the ground. It, there's no opportunity to spend any time except switch over in a few seconds or uh, less than a few minutes. So you can't obviously relaunch a satellite, put it in orbit, there's no time for that. Uh, there's people up there, you have to uh, take care of them right away. So if anything happens on these satellites, they just switch over to the next satellite that's already on station, already operating, already tested. So uh, that's where the spares are located. So it's a rather unique system. Uh, most satellite systems don't actually have entire satellites already launched and on orbit uh, during operation. The other interesting thing is the ground stations are redundant also. There's multiple ground stations. Same reason is that if anything happens, you just switch over to another ground station. Uh, you can't wait to uh, restart something or test it. So this system is operating with multiple redundant pieces all the time. 
And every so often they cycle between these redundant pieces to make sure that everything is operating. So NASA runs a pretty complex system. Um, the community, and by the way, uh, the note here, even during maintenance periods, uh, testing periods, they never shut off. The system never ever shuts off. They might switch over temporarily to one of these spare satellites or spare locations or switch to an alternate satellite as, for example, the space station is on the other side of the planet. You know you're on a certain set of satellites and ground stations. You have a certain amount of time in hours uh, before it comes back and you have to switch back on again. So all the maintenance, the testing is all done in these little windows of time. Uh, so they never ever go down or lose, uh, lose track of that. Um, and the communications are on microwave frequencies that we talked about. These are uh, how they do the communications. This is where it is. This is what allows them to get the, uh, the penetration to the atmosphere all the time. Uh, and it accounts for things like rain fade or cloud cover. It will work at microwave frequencies very well. So if we just look at the system a little bit more, uh, the stations uh, in New Mexico and uh, around Maryland, there's uh, the Pacific Ocean, there's stations, uh, and this is the uh, systems. This is from uh, 2015 was the constellation, and you could see that uh, these satellites are marked as what's called storage in the NASA file. Uh, what that means, it's on orbit, it's ready to go. It's already launched, it's already in orbit, it's already tested, and it's a hot live satellite. And that's where they place them, so they can be seen. Now, if you notice where the satellites are placed, they can pretty much see the entire planet. And the satellites can talk to each other in space. So if you get a, a, a low Earth orbit satellite over here, the, the space telescope or the space station, as long as it sees any one of these satellites, they remember very, very far away. So it can typically see two or three or sometimes four of these at any one time. As long as it sees one, it can communicate with it, and then the satellites are controlled to communicate with each other to relay back to the ground station. And the satellite itself, uh, what's up here? Well, this is uh, what you think of a satellite. There's some solar panels for power. There's some antennas on it, the large ones, small ones, uh, on the antennas. Uh, T, T, and C is your uh, telemetry tracking and control systems. And in here is your uh, payload uh, antennas and your payload system. The payload is the data traffic that's on here. And that's the uplink and downlink that's uh, actually sending the traffic back down to Earth. What, uh, what do we have on Earth? Well, on Earth, this is uh, an actual picture of the space to ground link antennas uh, in New Mexico at uh, one of the NASA stations. You get an idea of the size. Here's a building. All right, here's a, maybe a vehicle and a building, so maybe a one-story building or a one-and-a-half-story building. That's about the size of the antennas. Notice that they're pointed in different directions because they're actually, these antennas, the entire antennas move, and they will track the satellites continuously, and uh, there are multiple directions because they're simultaneously tracking multiple satellites. Now, the part that, uh, that I worked on on this was actually in the ground station, and it carried the data traffic. Uh, so I worked in, uh, I'm not sure it was this building or the, the sister building, um, to uh, replace and upgrade what's called the uh, frequency converters. And what happens here is uh, the way these behave is data comes in uh, on the ground. We transmit this. And uh, through what's called a transmitter or an up converter, we take the data on the ground and we put it on these microwave frequencies and we prepare it uh, in what's called phase and amplitude and all its uh, signal processing. So it's just the right way and just the right frequency to send to the antenna. And it goes to a, a very, very high power amplifier, something strong enough to send the signal all the way out to the satellites 36,000 miles away and still get there with very, very good signal integrity. Uh, that's the transmitter end of the up converter. On the other end, as data is collected coming down, uh, it gets received through the antenna, it goes through something called a down converter which it receives uh, the space communication. It uh, takes away the microwave frequencies, translates it back down to a terrestrial band, and sends it back out in a form that can be read by uh, terrestrial computers and processors and get the data back. Uh, the trick to doing this whole thing is that the up converter and down converter have to be what's called transparent to the system. They can't add any distortion whatsoever. 
So remember, we're, we're talking to something 36,000 miles away. This is many times the diameter of the Earth. That's how far away this stuff is. Uh, there's no room for error. And the data on here might be very sensitive data. Uh, you know, think about the resolution you get from pictures from the space telescope, or if there's information on the space station that needs to be uh, critically communicated a certain amount of time. Uh, there's no room for error on here. So when these uh, data packages and this information is translated down from these frequencies, uh, they have to be done with almost no distortion. And what has to happen is uh, these devices have to operate there and they have to operate continuously. So my role in the project was this system had been up for a number of years and uh, the group I was with was uh, selected to upgrade to uh, modern versions of the up converter and the down converter systems. And we went out to, uh, to New Mexico, uh, we actually measured the system. And in addition to building the systems without distortion, we also went and measured the actual links between the antennas and the buildings. And we actually compensated for some of the existing distortion in NASA's facility and built that into the devices. So they were really, really good. And you can get the data rates very, very high without distortion. Uh, so it was interesting because we had to go out, we had the measurements out there. Uh, then we came back, we had analyzed that, build those uh, inverse uh, functions back into the equipment. Uh, and then we actually went out and installed it, tested it there. And if you remember what I said before, that you only had windows of a few hours and blocks to do this. So what would happen is we'd be uh, making a measurement or running a test. Uh, we'd get a call from the, the station commander to say, okay, the space station or whoever was using the traffic is now on the other side of the planet. You have two hours or two and a half hours or three hours or five hours, whatever the window was before it came back around the earth again. So that was the window where we could uh, turn down that particular piece of equipment, disconnect it, run the tests, do the characterizations, plug it back in, check that it was plugged in and functioning correctly, turn it back on and be out of the way before the uh, spacecraft that was coming around the planet <laughs> came back around because the astronauts needed the communications. You, you couldn't make a mistake. Uh, so it was a pretty fascinating project to, uh, to get through that. And it was very successful. Uh, NASA was very happy. The uh, next thing I want to talk about is uh, another project. This is called the uh, Joint Polar Satellite System, or JPSS. Uh, and this is, a, again, an artist's rendition of one of the actual satellites. These are orbiting now. And what is this? This is a, a collaborative program between the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and NASA. And uh, what it's used for is uh, critical environmental data around the planet. Uh, temperature, humidity, moisture in the atmosphere, um, everything you'd want to know about uh, what's going on. Uh, in the atmosphere. And the interesting thing is we're not measuring this from a ground station. So there's no atmospheric distortion in the measurement. The measurement's being taken from space. So you're outside the atmosphere. It's looking down on the planet. So there's no distortion at the instrument because the instrument's in space outside the atmosphere. The way these worked is these satellites, there's a couple of them, and they move in what's called a polar orbit. So they don't go around the equator like a geosynchronous satellite. They actually go around the poles of the Earth. So if you imagine looking at the Earth north-south, it would be a vertical uh, type of orbit. And this is uh, what it's doing is uh, it's taking very, very high precision measurements. So here's a picture of the orbit. And to explain why you do a polar orbit, this is an interesting concept, is that the, the orbiting around the Earth uh, this way, vertically, if you will, are breaking the lines of latitude as it goes uh, along the uh, longitudinal axis of the Earth. And what's happening is the Earth is rotating. It's this way. So the Earth rotates and the satellite makes an orbit. As the satellite comes around again, the Earth has rotated. So the satellite can now observe the next piece of the Earth. So what happens is as the Earth rotates, the satellite observes the next slice, the next slice, the next slice of the planet. So it's a very interesting orbit because as the satellites travel around, they get to observe the whole planet in slices. Now I'll show you a picture of what the thermal energy actually looks like. So 
kind of interesting concept. So they're on continuously. They never turn off. <laughs> These are on all the time. They go for years continuously collecting this data. Uh, and they collect it from everywhere, including the poles, the equator, continents, oceans, everything. Just in one orbit, it'll see the way around the planet. When it rotates, it just keeps spinning around the orbit and the planet rotates under the spin. So you get these slices. What's on this satellite? Well, there's a bunch of instruments on here. There's ozone mapping, there's uh, cloud uh, measuring uh, instruments. There's what's called the cross-track infrared sounder for measurements. There's visible infrared and there's this uh, advanced technology microwave sounder. Um, this is what I'm going to focus on is the ATMS instrument. It's one of the more sensitive instruments on the, uh, the satellite. It's one of the things that gives it its uh, modern power to make uh, super high resolution measurements and be able to send that back down to Earth. It's this particular instrument. Uh, that's the one that I actually uh, worked on and built some parts for. So I'll, I'll explain those uh, as we go through it. So it measures, uh, this, as I said, this vertical column of temperature and atmospheric conditions. So if you imagine from space, these instruments are looking down at the Earth and they measure a column. So it's moving, but at any instant, it looks down from space to the atmosphere, down to the planet's surface. It gets this giant vertical column of all the conditions in the atmosphere at that moment. And as the satellite moves and the Earth moves, it measures the next piece, the next piece, and continuously collects this data, sends it back for analysis. So let's look at this, uh, this ATMS instrument. This is an actual picture of one of the instruments before launch at a NASA facility, and some dimensions on here. So you can see, uh, you know, get an idea of about the size of this. So you know, about two feet by a foot and a half or so. Um, and uh, inside this package over here, it's kind of sealed up to the picture is the electronics and the uh, pieces in there. There's a whole bunch of electronic systems in here. Um, the, uh, the pieces that, uh, that I worked on is actually uh, about five different modules that were in here, little pieces. And what they do, they had these super precision uh, amplifiers and filters in them. So what it actually did is it took the measurements and processed them through the, uh, the signal processing chain to prepare it to send it back down to Earth. And again, this stuff had to be on there. It had to work uh, with this incredible non-distortion property because it's collecting the super sensitive data. When the electronics add their own distortion, you lose the sensitivity of the data. You don't want to do that. So again, they, they work in this what's called transparent mode. So they'll translate all this data through with pretty close to zero distortion and process it and get it ready to send down to Earth uh, what's in there. The interesting thing about this versus the other project, the other project was a zero distortion type of thing, but you kind of delivered it very carefully by plane or by truck and dropped it off. These pieces, they actually had to survive a space launch and operate in space and still work without the uh, distortion. So kind of interesting. Just a, uh, a picture here. This is a, a thermal image of uh, one of the actual images captured from a, uh, an ATMS instrument on the, uh, the, um, the, Tidris, uh, the um, I'm sorry, the JPSS satellite. And if you can note, look at the, see the slants here? So everything is kind of slanted a little bit from top left to bottom right. The reason for that is due to the motion. Uh, the satellite is moving in a polar orbit and the Earth is rotating underneath. So you get a slight diagonal to the measurement as it goes through and you can actually see that in the measurement. So uh, this is, it. you know, it's fascinating to see how this works in the planetary dynamics and this all had to be planned ahead of time so they can expect uh, what to, uh, to get out of this. All right, the, uh, the third thing I want to talk about is uh, one more project, and this is something else that I worked on. This is the, uh, the Mars Science Laboratory, the Curiosity rover. Um, that's uh, an actual artist's rendition of the actual rover. So give you an idea what this was. This was a, um, the part that I worked, it went in what's called the cruise vehicle, and I'll show you a breakout of the parts. I'll show you exactly where that went. Uh, this part, um, it's 14 by nine feet or so. And I, I built a small electronics part inside the other part. Remember that in a, uh, a vehicle like this, uh, there's a lot of uh, propulsion elements, power elements, things, the communication electronics are one of the smaller pieces. Uh, 
And this, by the way, uh, the dimensions of the rover that it transported is the, uh, the mass of the different pieces. Um, kind of interesting. Uh, the piece that I built is actually on Mars uh, right now. <laughs> Uh, and it was used in the delivery of the uh, Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover. Uh, kind of happy it worked out pretty well. Uh, so it was a lot of other people. Um, the device was launched. It was built ahead of time, obviously, and tested. It was launched uh, from Cape Canaveral, Florida in 2011 in November. Um, yeah, it was launch vehicle, and it was headed to Mars. So it was on a, a little trip. Um, Mars was about 127 million miles away at the time. Uh, so that's where it was headed. Uh, it landed on August 5th. So you could see how many months it was traveling in space and uh, before it was activated, this, uh, this part. It was just going out there. On landing, it was 154 million miles away. Um, and the total distance it traveled was 352 million miles. So this was a, a little more than a short trip if this had to last out there. Um, and the interesting thing is, you. you Kind of far away. If anything goes wrong, there is absolutely no opportunity to fix it. Can't happen. Just has to work. Uh, and the time it takes to send a signal back was over 13 minutes. So even if there's a problem, you don't know for more than a dozen minutes. So that's the uh, the time it takes the speed of light to travel from Mars back to Earth over these millions of miles. So uh, some of these things about the landing phases that had to work completely autonomously. Because during landing on the Martian surface, uh, there's no time to send a signal from Earth. Because you think about it, it would take uh, 25 minutes or so, a round trip, to get a signal back and send a command back. There's no time. This thing is moving at a, a landing speed uh, very, very fast. And it landed. Uh, the, uh, the temperature at the landing site was somewhere between minus 130 degrees and freezing, depending on uh, different times during landing. This is when this device had to operate. So what was it? Well, it was, uh, this was the one, if you remember, that had this uh, sky crane that was lowered from a hovered vehicle. Uh, at the time, it was the largest vehicle ever sent to the Martian surface. And the concept was, because it was so large, they didn't want to just crash it on the surface, they were afraid that it would uh, impact too much. So the design was to come down in a vehicle but this hover vehicle would hover a certain distance above the planet's surface. And then it would very gently lower down on a crane, the, uh, the rover to the surface, and then disconnect and go away. Um, so a lot of systems had to work almost perfectly to get this to work, or pretty close to perfectly. Uh, the part that I uh, designed was actually inside this hover vehicle. And that's part of the communication system inside this hover vehicle that would operate there. So uh, if you think about it, what had to happen is that uh, this device had to survive a launch out of the Earth's atmosphere, and it had to survive a trip about 300 million miles and many, many months dormant all the way to Mars. Then it had to survive entry into a Martian atmosphere. Then as they got close to the Martian surface at these uh, really extreme temperatures, it had to just turn on and work perfectly, no flaws. And fortunately, it and a lot of other systems on there really did. Uh, this has worked out really well. What's inside here, this hover vehicle, the whole thing, this is a little breakout of what's in here. This is the, uh, the rover was packed in here, was packed in this shell underneath the heat shield. This heat shield is for coming through the Martian atmosphere. So this was actually de designed for Martian atmosphere properties, not Earth atmosphere properties. That's where the, uh, the landing took place. This was the descent stage that became the hover vehicle, and it was inside a back shell and a cruise stage to get it into the Martian atmosphere. Uh, just to give you an idea, the size of the rover, that's what it was next to a, an average size man. So this is a very, very large piece of hardware that's being deposited. It wasn't a small uh, you know, desk sized rover that's being put here. Uh, so you really had to pay attention to what was going on. Um, the, uh, what the device I designed was actually in here. It was uh, a signal distribution device for RF communications. Uh, in here to distribute the communication signals around uh, different systems within the device that had to communicate. Um, this is what I talked about before, what it had to be able to survive and just turn on and work. Uh, to give you an idea of what this, uh, this landing looked like, this is uh, from NASA. And they give you this rendition. They said, you, we entered the Martian atmosphere. 
and then it had a balance, then it had some interfaces, then it had its peak heating, uh, its heat field as it moved through the upper and to the uh, lower atmosphere. Then it decelerated, then it did some maneuvering, uh, then it deployed a parachute to slow it down a certain level, and this was about seven miles above the, uh, above the planet. And then it would jettison the heat shield as it slowed down to about five miles. Uh, at this point, it started turning on its own uh, radar and pointing toward the Martian surface to get altitude information using its own onboard radar. Then the, uh, the back shell would separate to this uh, landing device. It'd be a powered descent. Its own rockets would turn on, fire these retro rockets, stabilize it, and then during stabilization, lower the... Uh, the um, the rover to the surface using the crane. And, and this is the area that my part uh, worked on. Um, give you a close up of that area. Uh, and the rover came down, uh, came to about 66 feet. So you've got a seven story building above the surface. And that's kind of where it held. And that's about the point it started lowering down on the, uh, the sky crane. Uh, slowed to a very, very slow speed. And from the seven story building up, it lowered this. Uh, life-size, human-size rover down to the planet. Uh, it disconnected it, and then once that was done, it disconnected and it took off and it actually crashed uh, a little diff distance away. Um, so interesting challenge to work in uh, an extraterrestrial atmosphere and, uh, and be able to work uh, flawlessly under these conditions like that. Uh, and the rover worked out really, really well. It uh, collected data for a long time, still on Mars. Um, not sure if it's still operating or not. There's some other things that were landed since then, collecting a little more interesting data nowadays. Uh, but those are the devices. That's where uh, my pieces were. So uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, turn it back over to Mark. Thanks, Larry. That was great. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I started jotting down a whole bunch of questions myself, but I know we have uh, I know we also have questions from from others. Um, let, let me first uh, let me start with a question, and then we'll um, we'll see if we have some questions from the audience. And for those of you who are watching, um, please feel free to pose uh, your questions in chat. We'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, and you know we'll we'll be here until uh, till eight pm, so we'll have some time to to get to quite a few questions. Uh, so let me see. Let me start with. Well, I'll, I'll ha I have a question uh, to start because I was jotting some down. So I'll, I'll prime things with a question of my own. Um, one of the things that you talked about when you were talking about the TDRS satellites um, and those constellations um, is that they are sort of clustered around, I guess, four specific sites around the globe. You mentioned uh, like Maryland and um, Guam and uh, either Mexico or New Mexico. Um, do those clusters of satellites always stay, always hover around those same spots on the globe? So do they sort of do they constantly sort of move at the same pace as the globes so that they're always sort of center around those spots? Is that sort of how it works? Uh, it, it's an interesting question because it, it's hard if you you haven't worked in this field to conceptualize what's actually happening. Uh, what you do is it, it's a Newton uh, physics mechanics problem that gets solved. Mm. And if you look at the angular rotation of the Earth, and you want to match the speed, match the angular rotation of the Earth. What you do is you, at what altitude do you have to go up such that your orbital velocity matches the angular velocity of the Earth? Right. That's how you get up at this 36,000 kilometers. If you were lower than that, you have to move faster. Otherwise, you get pulled in by the Earth's gravity. If you go too fast, you'll escape the Earth's gravity and you'll head off toward the moon or, or somewhere else. So it's this balancing act in velocity versus gravitational pull. And so the farther away you go, the slower you need to go because you're farther away from the planet. There's less gravity. So uh, what you do is you try and find the altitude above the Earth so that uh, your speed matches the angular rotation of the Earth. Gotcha. So that's how you end up in this geosynchronous orbit. And it's calculated to around 36,000 kilometers gotcha. above the uh, surface of the Earth. So there's a whole bunch of communication satellites up there, not just the Tedra system. It's actually right. pretty crowded nowadays. And that, that's actually a really good segue into um, a question that, that someone had. Um, uh, and just a, a note, they're, yeah. they're not entirely clustered sometimes. You, know, it, you see it clustered on there. They could be 
hundreds of miles apart, or thousands right, right. of miles apart at that altitude. Right, right. Um, this is a question from Evangelos uh, Tomatos, who also um, shorthand goes by ET, which is perfect for today's session. <laughs> um, so I'm going to refer to him as ET for the duration, which is what he's listed as um, in our in our uh, list of participants. Uh, one of the questions, uh, which is directly related to what you just mentioned, uh, Larry, um, he asks, it seems there are many of these, uh, in, the, in the case of the Tetris satellites, um, many of these in geosynchronous orbit, it seems crowded up there at 36 kilometers. Are there any issues with traffic up there, collisions and things of that nature? So how does um, that finish up there? Uh, yeah, there's- so Like an FAA, like a NASA FAA sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, on? there's international organizations uh, and all the countries are treaty sign signatories to it. And when you're launching something up in here, you, you kind of get your slot as to where your, your satellite is. And, uh, and they get located in these slots. And if you think about it, um, it, it gets crowded, but where is it crowded? It's crowded with the population centers. You know, the, over the Pacific Ocean, there's lots of space because there's nobody there. Uh, over the Americas, over Africa and Europe, it, it's pretty crowded over, uh, you know, Asia, Indonesia area, it's pretty crowded in those areas. So you do get clusters around there because that's where the people are. That's where a lot of the, uh, the ground stations are, where the traffic is. Um, but you know, you got to think what crowded is. If you do the geometry problem and you look at 36,000 miles away, you go off fractions of a degree and you're, you're hundreds of miles. Right. <laughs> These satellites are, you know, what are they, about the size of a room in a building, approximately. Some are larger, maybe size of a building, some of the, the larger ones. And so even if they moved a mile away, uh, they're not really going to interfere with each other. Um, are, are there collisions? It's always a fear because everything's in motion. So we're always trying to uh, maintain this. And one of the things I mentioned was what's called the TT and C is telemetry tracking and control. Every one of those satellites is under continuous control. And they have a little bit of onboard positioning in there because they have to be put back on their orbit every so often. Right. Uh, things like the moon goes by and its gravity pulls it out a little bit. Gotcha. So uh, there is some control and uh, that's what's up there all the time. Uh, so I've got a question uh, as well and it may be related to something you just mentioned but it, it reminded me that I jotted something down about this. You, you mentioned about um, the satellites being on all the time. How are they on all the time? I mean, it, you know, are there um, and, and maybe that sounds like an oversimplified question, but you know, is it um, you know, is it that they are they they run on on some sort of a, uh, electric batteries or something that are then replaced during those windows of time where they can get replaced and stuff like that? Is that how they are maintained? Yeah, when, when you design a satellite, uh, the power system, typically a solar power system, is typically what's used, and the size of the system is designed so it can function during the uh, the light period. And at some point it's around the other side of the earth and it's shielded from the sun, it's not collecting. So there's batteries on board, or the equivalent of batteries. And the solar system has to be designed so it's large enough to charge the batteries sufficiently to survive the dark area, plus the operation during the light period, and plus a margin built in or something. Right. So you get these oversized solar panels on purpose because you wanna charge the batteries while you're operating while you have the sun. Gotcha. Uh, we have a question from Rob um, for the polar orbiting satellites. Um, the, I forget what those are called. The J. The JPSS. JPSS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how does the flight control system compensate for the Earth's bulge? And that's a very good question. Uh, if you remember, the Earth isn't a sphere. It's what's called an oblate spheroid. So it actually bulges out a little bit at the equator uh, versus the uh, poles. So what actually happens, they choose an orbit that's high enough to work at the bulge or at the equator. And then as it moves around, uh, it understands that as it moves, that its altitude from the Earth's surface is actually slightly variable. And the interesting thing is, is that uh, what's variable, the atmosphere and the Earth is pretty constant. It's the distance to the satellite is variable. So what's happening, it's the space segment that's actually moving because you put it in a pretty constant orbit. And as it moves around, you know, it, it kind of goes up and down. But uh, if you look at the atmosphere and the Earth, uh, the atmosphere itself, it, it moves up and down together, what it's measuring. So it's not really moving. So the only thing that's being compressed or expanded is the space segment. The space is a vacuum. There's almost no distortion in space. So it's actually very easily compensated for as you, as you go through the altitude changes. 
example. I, I, I think it's rather insulting that we were talking about the Earth's bulge here, but um, you know, it's <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, get a tighter belt or something. I don't know, but. Um, oh, is it my turn? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, he's a, it, the Earth is a little round in the middle. I mean, you know, so am I now, you know, I'm a little older. Um, another question from ET. Um, and it's related to the JPRS system as well. Um, he asks, if the satellite is rotating from pole to pole, pole to pole continuously, what is receiving the messages and data? And also, is it free for all on the planet to gain access to that data? Like, how, how do we receive signals from the JPRS to use that data? Yeah, pay your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it stays in, uh, there's onboard storage. So it does uh, communications. It also does uh, different slices. So if it's out of range, it can do uh, an onboard storage and transmit back uh, afterwards. Uh, also, there's all kinds of other systems. For example, it could be in contact with the Tetra system or things like that, which can see everything. So it just needs to relay the data back. It doesn't necessarily need to be real time because there's a tremendous amount of data that's got to get processed. Most of the time, it actually doesn't come back real time. It's a bit of a delay that, right. uh, that goes in there. Uh, as far as access to the data, um, last time I checked that uh, you could contact NOAA and make arrangements to see certain aspects of the data. Some, a lot of it the government owns. There are certain parts of it that they do release to uh, university projects and government-funded university projects and things like that. So I, I believe there is a path to see some of that data uh, commercially. Um, and I'm not sure uh, where the government is actually in the program to release that or do that. That's more a question for NOAA. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the NOAA that you were referring to earlier. Correct, National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration. Yes. Um, we have another question here, which is a highly technical one. I was trying to avoid this becoming a technical conversation, but I'll, but I'll ask it um, j just to uh, um, honor the request. Um, this is from, um, and forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrect incorrectly, uh, JBM. Um, he says he's really, or they say they're really interested in detail about the um, RF system design, and they had a question for um, the micro, the, the millimeter wave frequency spectrum, such as S band and KU band. Can you tell us which technology um, is used to design the transceiver and receiver chip that works at that spectrum? <laughs> it, it's a good question. Uh, the one that works. <laughs> <laughs> There's multiple technologies in there. And what you do is you, when you design these parts, you, you pick and choose. For example, there's what's called uh, heterojunction bipolar technology or HBT. There's, uh, um, nowadays they use gallium nitride as one of the semiconductors they use for high power and higher efficiency. Uh, what you do is the particular requirements, of these highly specialized systems, uh, you have to come up with a solution that works in there. Uh, and you have to figure out which technology matches that particular requirement for that particular aspect of the system. So it's interesting to say for the RF uh, chain, which technology is in there. Uh, the RF chain has a lot of parts to it. There's your amplifiers, your converters, your filters, there's all these different parts to it, and they all may use different technologies. And you'll have to select the one that's appropriate for the particular subsection that you're working on to meet those, uh, those requirements to not distort the uh, traffic signals. So I, I know they were looking for a, a more specific, it's this one or that one, but the answer is it, it's a lot of them. Right. Uh, you put it where it's necessary. And this is part of the, the design challenges when you, uh, you get into things like this, is that uh, you have to understand uh, not only what the customer's needs are, but how to meet them so that you can combine the technologies that are available with the system configurations that can be developed or engineered so you can meet the solutions and, and get this thing to work. And, and not only work in and of itself, uh, part of the, the difficulty in doing this, you have to appreciate that it's in a larger system. So it not only operates in and of itself, it has to operate uh, in concert with all the associated systems next to it. Yeah. So yeah. you could pick something and say, this is the best thing here, but it turns out that power supply that's gonna be on board the spacecraft isn't gonna handle that during the uh, certain conditions. Uh, so it might be work good for a terrestrial application, but it might not be good for a, uh, a flight application. Right. So you'd have to switch technologies, maybe even be forced to a, would be considered a, a lower or less modern technology, be forced into it, have to make it work because of the, uh, the extreme conditions up in space. And there's no power cord from the, uh, the electric company up to space. Right. Uh, and it can only be so big. And they say, oh, why can't you make a bigger battery? 
well, then the launch vehicle has to be bigger and the fuel and the rocket has to be bigger and, and the cost goes up and the risk goes up and uh, all these issues come into play. So it's appreciating the whole system to get all these pieces to work. And when I give a summary of the pieces, and we only have about a half hour, an hour or so, uh, sometimes we, we don't appreciate how many moving parts there are. Right. To get this to work, they all have to work together. And, and when you work on these projects, um, one of the challenging things that I find interesting is learning about the rest of the systems and being able to find a way to try and make those decisions to help out everybody. Because right. they're doing the same for our systems. So I'm going to ask a question. Um, I know we have at least one person who's logged on who's a, a, perhaps a, a future uh, aerospace engineer. Um, and I'm curious for, for their benefit, um, what, what should they be thinking about doing now to prepare them for potential future in aerospace engineering? I mean, you know, going into college and whatnot, should they be you know, sort of what are the things that they should be focusing on if they want a future career in something like this? Sort of like, what's the path you took and, <laughs> and what's a path that you might recommend for them? It, it's, uh, it's not a straightforward answer because things are changing all the time. Um, what I found is uh, I needed a very substantial background to be well-versed in fundamentals, uh, electronics fundamentals, uh, system fundamentals. Uh, I spent a lot of time developing that to, uh, to gain that. So when I moved to the system arena, I had a very good appreciation of what went into these systems. Uh, and this way I can, I, I found I was able to address these problems uh, a little more intuitively because it wasn't just from a system perspective. I already had worked on a lot of the pieces that went into these systems. Right. So if I was asking for a part to be put into a system, uh, I, I had a, a little bit of insight as to what, uh, what it took to make that part and what was reasonable to ask and what was maybe a little bit of science fiction to ask for. Hmm. Uh, because I had actually been challenged and worked on all those pieces uh, together. So I guess the advice would be to try and figure out which aspect that they would be most interested in. Is it more systems, more components? Is it more uh, flight dynamics? Is it more ground uh, stations? Uh, and then find out where the interest lies and then spend some time to get some very, uh, get well-versed in the background and the fundamentals uh, that goes around that particular aspect. Uh, a little bit of historical perspective helps as well because a lot of times a uh, system doesn't build completely from scratch. We build on things because that, as you can, get a sense, this stuff's up in space. You can't fix it once it's launched. It has to work, it has to stay up there for its entire lifetime, no problems. Uh, very, very rare that anything is ever sent up to fix. Like at one time, the, the space shuttle went and did a correction on the Hubble Space Telescope. So out of the thousands and thousands of satellites, you get maybe a handful that actually can be corrected. It's so expensive, it's worth it to, uh, to do that. So you have to appreciate the, this environment, what's up there. And uh, so you want to verse yourself in which aspect and which background is going to help you for your interest area. I guess the, the best way to do it. All right. So you have a question from uh, Paul. He asks um, whether or not NASA located and, and photo imaged the uh, the sky crane after it detached and, and crash landed. Um, oh, oh, yeah. And, and could it have made a soft landing on the surface or was it sort of designed to just be disposed of. It, there is a picture. Uh, you can go on to NASA, and, and I searched it before I found the picture. Uh, somewhere I have a copy of it that I downloaded. Uh, and it shows you the, the crater area where it landed, and they actually have arrows pointing. Here's where the vehicle landed. Here's where the sky crane landed. Here was the landing site. And they, they all have that. So that was all. Uh, since this, uh, this particular landing, there's been other observations of Mars. So they've since taken the pictures and located it. And that's how we got them from the subsequent missions. Um, could it have been done differently? Yeah, it could have been done differently. Uh, what was decided at the time was this was the lowest risk to get this tremendous size payload down to the planet. And that's how they came up with this. Because remember, it's uh, a lot of these decisions might not be purely technical. Yeah, technically we could do it this way or that way. Uh, the risk aspect uh, sometimes is primary in the decision process. Right. Because you know, think about that. Even if something happens, we don't know about it until 14 minutes later. Right. Uh, it's got to work all by itself. Yeah, I, I wrote a question uh, down for myself, which is a good segue from this one, which is, so when do you get to go up to Mars to pick that up? 
Now I'm happy right here. I'll watch. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm telescope. Okay. <laughs> and you, I mean, you also mentioned that uh, you said the temperature on the on the surface of Mars was between minus one thirty two and freezing. So I guess once we do go to Mars, we've got to bring a sweater, right? Yeah, maybe two. That was just that particular day. It gets worse that was a warm day. Summer. That was summer. <laughs> that was that was an average day. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're coming up near the top of the hour. Let's see, we've got, um, let's see, I think we have another couple questions here. So we have another question from Rob. Um, do you see a future where those ground stations increasingly become part of cloud providers so they can build um, edge to cloud satellite apps so that that data is readily available to anyone? Or is it still sort of, it's gotta come down, it's gotta be, um, you know, process is synthesized or is there a future in that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. It, it, there's a lot of work going on that now. There's these uh, large uh, LEO or low Earth orbit constellations being put up, and there's a lot of concepts out there. They're trying to get these to work in uh, what's called a mesh network, so they can go up and they kind of be self-aware and talk to each other and, and relay around. Uh, at some point, you got to communicate with the ground because people are on the ground. People are not in space. So that piece is never really going to go away. You got to get the data to people to make it useful. Um, there's also concepts where they're actually storing some of the data in space. Uh, so part of what would be considered the cloud would now be a, a space located uh, server, if you will, or something uh, cloud-based, to use a, a very broad term of the word cloud, because uh, obviously you're outside the clouds. Right. Um, but uh, so, you know, all these concepts are in play right now, and there's a lot of uh, ways to use it. And what, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of entities are trying to figure out where the customer base is and, and what makes sense to set things up. Uh, now, obviously, once you're in space, you're kind of crossing international boundaries. So there's a whole other aspect of system design and parameters you have to work around. Uh, you know, for the fixed stations, uh, they're not going to go away for the geosynchronous satellites because they appear at a fixed location in the sky. They don't move. So it wouldn't make sense to move them because they're, they're done on purpose to match the Earth's rotation. Right. So those are there. So any kind of relay network that would use them, those large ground stations, you'd want them fixed and you'd, you'd want to spend money on them because they're going to always look at that one point and they'll maintain high levels of traffic. So the data rates were very high. Um, a lot of the old, low Earth orbit stuff uh, may have a limited lifetime, maybe in months. Some of these uh, CubeSats and things, they don't last uh, too long in deorbit because uh, they're not large enough to carry enough fuel to keep them up in orbit uh, from other planetary distortions. Uh, so uh, they go up and they, they can operate these mesh networks, you know, there's all those concepts and they'll do things and keep up, but you got to continuously launch them <laughs> to keep them up there. Uh, so it, a lot of these network design concepts are in place. Do, do I see a future? Yeah, I'm sure there's all kinds of applications for it. It's just a matter of uh, uh, how you solidify the concept for the particular application that that uh, entity is trying to do. Right. Um, that's a, actually something you mentioned there is a perfect segue to the last question we have time for this evening. Um, you mentioned the lower Earth orbit satellites and how they, you know, they have maybe, they're maybe up there for eight months or seven, seven months or something like that. Um, so one of the questions I had, again, from ET was, uh, what is the lifetime of the TDRS and JPRS satellites? Is there, you know, is it, um, are they limited in their lifespan by the battery technology or any other things? How long have they been up there to begin with? I think you mentioned the dates, but are they intended to be there forever or? <laughs> we, we'd like them to be there ever, forever, but they can't. Uh, what actually controls the life of a satellite is something very, very low tech, it's rocket fuel. That's it. And the reason why is because uh, on orbit, remember they're totally disjoint from the earth. So back to this Newton mechanics uh, concept, you, you kind of, uh, what's your reference plane is what it is, the physics come into play. Um, so how do you maintain your space in space, if you will, your slot? Uh, because you, you, there's other people up there, other, other traffic, there's other satellites, low earth or, or geosynchronous, how do you maintain that spot? And also if it moves too far, think of that distance, that antenna moves just a little bit It'll miss the planet, right? Not the city. The whole planet will get missed. <laughs> so you got, you got to be very, very well pointed all the time. So we have some other things in space. Uh, we have the moon, we have comets, we have uh, the sun, we have the other planets. Remember, you're tethered to nothing. So as this, the moon, for example, orbits, its own gravity kind of pulls all the satellites a little bit because they're in a velocity proportional to Earth because that's where we're sending and the antennas are pointed to. When the moon goes by, they all move a little bit. So they're slightly out of their orbit. They can tolerate a certain amount of deviation from the orbit before the, uh, the antennas can't correct them. 
So they got to put the satellite back into orbit. That's that telemetry tracking and control system, that TTC is always monitoring this. And every so often they have to fire a tiny little rocket, a little burst and put it back into its slot. So the life of the satellite is when it runs out of fuel and they can't make that correction anymore, they use the last little bit of fuel to do a control of the orbit and burn it up and let it go. Gotcha. Uh, and that's all it is. So some rockets have very large fuel supplies. They can be up there for years. Some are small ones. They could be a year or two. Uh, the Tedris ones are designed to be, I think it's greater than eight years or something, uh, first satellite. And they, they, as the technology gets better, we get more efficient at this. So they, they stay up longer. So the, the modern satellites can be up there for greater than a decade in some cases. Um, and they're experimenting with other propulsion systems, but uh, the rockets are just a very tiny correction. So they, uh, they kind of help just the right amount. And the issue is why can't we put more fuel up there? Well, of course we can, but now the launch rocket has to carry up all that extra fuel and weight and put that up. And at some point, the launch rocket is so large, it doesn't pay anymore. It right. actually yeah. pays to buy a new satellite. All right, well, we're coming up the top of the hour. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap up here. Uh, I, I did want to uh, share some information very quickly with everyone uh, before we move on. Just a, a reminder of some uh, other events we've got coming up from the CUAA. We've got events, three events coming up in April. A, a trivia night, a, another alumni showcase with an art alum, uh, and a virtual visit to the Greenwood Cemetery, which is the Cooper Hewitt Grace site, and additional events in May and June. You can follow us online for more information on our website, Instagram and Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. And um, with that, I just want to thank, you know, thank a few people. I want to thank the uh, CUA Communications Committee and the Office of Alumni Affairs for uh, helping spread the word about tonight's event. Thank you to the events committee for bringing events like this to the alumni body. Um, thanks to Yvette Francis, a member of the events committee and a fellow alum for connecting us with Larry for tonight's event. Thank you, of course, to Larry for being with us tonight and for sharing your, uh, your talk. And of course, thank you to all of you uh, for being here this evening with us and participating. We hope to see you at some future events. Um, as I mentioned earlier, tonight's event was, was recorded and will be available uh, online soon and we'll let people know when that recording is available. So thank you very much. Uh, be well and stay safe, everyone. Take care.